Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for having me. I'm super excited to be here, um, especially at the Barbican, which is an amazing venue. Um, I'm very excited to be talking about my favorite topic, which is building ridiculous websites. Um, it took me a long time to kind of become comfortable with the fact that I didn't enjoy giving talks about what this library does or like how to do something valuable for your career, whatever like that. <laughs> um, honestly, my favorite kind of talks are like the ones that we've just seen from Alistair, for, for example, of the ones that just inspire you and just think, yeah, the web can do that. That's amazing. And so um, it might be less inspiring and more the web can do that uh, in this one. <laughs> but um, uh, I hope that you have as much fun as I, uh, watching it as I did putting this together. Um, so yeah, my name is Sophie. Uh, a lot of people didn't recognize me today. Um, I did get caught in the rain on the way here and all the purple fell out of my hair. But um, <laughs> I, um, I'm the web engineering lead at Monzo, which is actually five minutes down the road. Um, I have a website, localghost.dev. Fun fact, I'm using reveal.js for this, uh, which is the first time doing that. And I keep typing local ghost instead of local host. So it was possibly not the best idea. You can find me on Twitter at type underscore underscore error. Cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm on a mission this year to bring back the spirit of the old web, that kind of weird and wonderful creativity of like the late 90s and the early 2000s, where there kind of weren't any rules. The only rules were that you just kind of did whatever you thought was cool. Um, and yeah, the web used to be weirder. And for a whole generation of internet <laughs> users, Having a homepage was the cool thing to do, right? We kind of, we got the internet in the late 90, 90s and was like, oh wow, I'm gonna have a homepage. This was pre-social media, pre-web 2.0. And there were websites like Geocities, Angelfire, Tripod, Xpage, uh, these free static hosting for everyone. And the number of personal websites on the internet boomed. Of course, compared to the number of websites now, I mean, it's, it's you know barely comparable, but for then, there were a lot of personal websites. And a lot of these websites like Geocities, for example, even offered drag and drop page builders, so you didn't even need to know HTML. And we might look back on these websites now and laugh. I mean, they do look ridiculous compared to like the sleek and minimalist sites that we know today, but I think we've gone too far in the other direction because I think a lot of these websites look the same. And back then, these sites were kind of a reflection of yourself. You know, you put your own personality into these websites. Uh, you put whatever you wanted on there just to see what would happen. You experimented. Um, and all sorts of people would build home pages, not just devs, right? Not just nerds. Um, families would build websites for sharing photos. People with very, very specific hobbies. <laughs> and fan sites as well. Um, I caught this screenshot mid-marquee scroll. Um, and that is a frame-based layout for, final f for a Final Fantasy website. And um, you might be familiar with this video game called Hypnospace Outlaw, uh, which came out a few years ago. It is absolutely fantastic. It's an in I think it's an indie game, but it, it, you play this moderator on this version of the 90s internet where, that you access in your sleep. <laughs> um, and it, it, was, it was directly inspired by these home pages on Geocities, and it really captures those vibes of, of the 90s web. I think it's absolutely wonderful. So I do recommend playing that if you haven't already. But playing things like this and kind of just doing some research for other talks that I've been doing this year just made me think, you know, let's, let's bring back the weird, right? I would love to see this spirit return today, this kind of experimental and fun side of the web. And my goal with this talk is to show you how we can be just as creative using modern and accessible methods. Because as fun as these websites were, they were an absolute nightmare for web accessibility, right? No, we didn't use semantic HTML, we didn't know what it was. We built layouts using tables instead of using them for like tabular data. Uh, everything was flashing, everything was moving, but we can still achieve the same effects today while considering who's on the other end of our browser. Um, so I'm gonna bring the, the uh, examples in with a motion warning. There is quite a lot of animation in this uh, talk. It was kind of inevitable and I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but I'll let you know when it's finished. So, um, the natural thing to do for this talk was to build a website. So I built a website um, <laughs> using some of my favorite 90s web tropes, but I used as much modern HTML, CSS, and JavaScript as I could. And like Alistair, my definition of modern CSS is just like CSS3, basically. Anything that's, that is around today. 
Um, so we're going to look through some of the things that it features and how we might create them today. Well, Geo's city sites were famously covered in GIFs with a hard G. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so things like flames, construction workers, animated bullet points, weird illustrations, you name it. It was a lot of fun. This is from Cameronsworld.net, which is, is quite old now, but it is, they just basically combed GeoCities for weird GIFs and put them all on this beautiful, like, what I can only describe as like an art collection of GIFs. It's really wonderful. Um, and it was a real art form to squeeze these frames into a small file size, as small as possible. And it's easier than ever now to use animation in your, um, in your website, especially considering internet speed or modern formats like GIF-V, WebM, um, or even SVG animation, so using S uh, CSS or Greenstock to um, animate SVGs. And back then, of course, we used to write our HTML in capitals, because that was what was correct. Um, but we, I mean, people still do this today, right? You just drop your image tag in um, with the GIF. But autoplaying GIFs can be a big problem for people with things like epilepsy or vestibular disorders. But today, um, we have something that they didn't have back then, which was media queries, and specifically the prefers reduced motion query. And this tells us whether the visitor has reduced motion enabled on their system, which disables some animations. And so in this case, we can choose to only render the GIF or play the animation if their reduced motion settings are set to no preference. So that means that people with access needs can still enjoy our trash website. <laughs> We've got the picture tag now in HTML5, and this lets us specify an alternative source for an image. So we still have the image tag here. This has the still version of the GIF, and I created that by just opening the GIF in preview, pulling out the first frame and saving it as, as a PNG. Um, but the source tag here has an alternative uh, source if the media attribute is satisfied. So in this case, we're checking, does prefers reduced motion equal no preference? And if so, then we replace the image source with, this, with the animated version. I'm sure many of you remember adding countless marquee tags to your home pages to make text scroll across the screen. And then if you were fortunate enough to have Netscape, I didn't you would have had blink, <laughs> which makes text flash. Now, things like this make body text really hard to read, even if you don't have any like, traditional access requirements. And I chose not to recreate these for my site, even though I had to recreate them for these slides. Um, but instead, I thought, OK, how can we have fun with text in a 90s way? Uh, with our head, um, and I thought with our headers, right? So back in the day, we would have had screen, uh, we would have had images of text in a, as our site header, maybe like cool text with flames animated or uh, something like that. But we can actually make cool text with CSS now in a way that is still accessible because ultimately it's just text. Um, so for this next section, I decided to draw inspiration from an iconic 90s classic, which is Microsoft Word Art. <laughs> Yes, I'm a child of the, of the 90s, um, so uh, for me, uh, you know, while not strictly from the 90s web, this for me harks back to this aesthetic of like <coughs> 90s maximalism. Um, so this is a screenshot from Microsoft Word, which I had to download a trial of to get this screenshot, but um, <laughs> I'm going to show you how I recreated this uh, in CSS. Um, <laughs> so some things to consider first is that in CSS, we can't fill text with a gradient. Um, but you can give something a gradient background. And there's a cool property in CSS called background clip, which dictates where in a container the background is painted. And one of the possible values for background clip is text. So you can actually say, only paint the background where there's text. So we can set a purple gradient on our fan. We can clip the background to the text. And we make the actual text transparent, so only the background shows through. And then we can add a skew and some scale functions to get the right shape of that word art. And this is the result. Now, I'm saying, mm. <laughs> get in there, we're getting there. This is the result, but now we need to add the text shadow, right? Otherwise, it's not true word art if it doesn't have a point shadow. So, <laughs> this is what happens if we try to add text shadow to this. Why is this happening? Well, what we're looking at is the shadow on top of the background because the gradient bit is the background. The text is still there, but it's 
on top is just transparent. If I make it visible, it sits on top of the text. We need to go behind the background to show a drop shadow, so we need a parent element. So we can add another span wrapping that span called the, with the wrapper, and then we can add a filter on that parent element. Because the child has background cut to text, the drop shadow follows that too. So actually, that drop shadow is going to cut to the text as well. And then we get this, which I'm, I'm putting, I think is pretty good. It's pretty identical. Um, I have found from giving this talk elsewhere as well that it doesn't show up very well on a big screen. Um, but um, the next one, I think, uh, is another fun uh, drop shadow effect. <laughs> this was my personal favorite. I used it on everything, all my homework. Um, this is slight, This is kind of similar, but slightly different. So another linear gradient background clip here cool, but we've got a different shadow, so we've got this kind of 3D effect. Well, like before, we'll create that background gradient and clip it to the shape of the text. We use Arial Black this time. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but the shadow for this text is a little different because it's kind of skewed and it's, it's kind of falling backwards. So we have a wrapper for this one, and we use the perspective, uh, perspective property. And what this does is put us into a sort of 3D mode, right? So the z-axis starts having a, an effect. And the perspective um, for property says, act as if I'm standing this far away from this element. So in our case, we're kind of 100 pixels away from the word. And then the perspective origin determines the position that we're looking at it from, in this case, the bottom center of the word. And, um, oh yeah, sorry. And, um, I've used the before pseudo element to create the shadow element. So um, we need to um, create the shadow effect by setting the content to the word word art to mirror the text. But then we can apply transformations to make it look like a shadow. So first of all, we, um, we can color it and make it near transparent. Um, but we also transform it by um, rotating it and skewing it. But because we've got this perspective rule set on the parent element, um, the, the, it takes the perspective into account and it actually warps differently. So it warps from the perspective of where you're standing, 100 pixels away in the front. So rather than just a simple rotation, it will rotate kind of in a 3D way. And this is the result. It's cool, right? But this is hard coded to the word word art. What if we want to reuse the class with a different word? Well, CSS is clever like that, see? There's a function called ATTR. I tried to pronounce this as a word, but I couldn't figure out how. But you can dynamically get the value of an attribute using the ATTR function. In this case, I've called it data content. So in this case, I've got the word rainbow, and the parent wrapper um, data content attribute is set to rainbow, so the shadow will match the text. I think it looks pretty good. Enough for a throwback site header. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cool. All right, what else is 90s? Let's think. <laughs> I had a Neopets shop in 2001, <laughs> and this MIDI file would play when you opened the page. And <laughs> um, there were no, <laughs> I'm gonna turn it off. There were no <laughs> controls. It was totally, it was totally hidden. Uh, the embed tag would be totally hidden. It's distracting and disorientating. I can't even talk to you with it playing. Uh, I don't know how anyone was supposed to use a website with uh, auto-playing audio. And in fact, modern browsers today will block auto-playing audio because it's a nightmare. But you can still have music on your site. No one is stopping you from having music on your site. Why don't people put music on their site anymore? It can be opt-in. Um, you can use the HTML5 audio element to, add, um, to, to embed some music, but also have controls at the same time. Um, add an ARIA label to tell assistive technology what it's controlling. And you can even get creative and customize the controls. So this is just the default Firefox rendering of, of, of controls. But you can actually use the Web Audio API, create some fancy buttons, and hook them up to make it pretty as well. All right. This is going to unlock a core memory for some of you in this room. <laughs> Cursor trails were definitely a bit of a flex. It was to show off what you could do with JavaScript, or in the case of me and my friends, what dynamicdrive.com could do with JavaScript. 
Um, these cursors were made with something called dynamic HTML, which uh, is a bit like how we use the term Jamstack today, right? It's a collection of technologies. In this case, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, but it's like old JavaScript before Ajax. Um, so you couldn't do very much with it. Um, and as we, as we learned this morning, like Internet Explorer and Netscape were the dominant browsers at the time. It was a time called the Browser Wars. And they had very different JavaScript implementations, uh, which led to stuff a bit like this. So this would have made a trail of little three pixel squares following your cursor, only seven of them, because it's, it's, it's just too much to render more than that. Um, and there was a function on in Internet Explorer only worked in Internet Explorer called document.all, which would uh, return a collection of all the elements in the DOM. And inside, and so we check to see if document.all exists, and if it does, we know we're in Internet Explorer, right? And then we can write uh, elements to the DOM using document.write, um, which we don't use anymore. Um, if you're in Netscape, however, you'd use layers. And these were their version of divs, so they didn't have divs, they had layers. And if you ever hear someone talking about div layers, that's just a relic from this time when we had divs and we had layers, so everyone just called them div layers to, be, uh, to make it simple. Um, so again, if we, were, if we were writing a script that we wanted to work in Netscape, we'd check for the existence of document.layers to see if we were using Netscape. So things have got a bit better since then. Um, and luckily, someone else has done has gone the hard work of recreating cursor trails in JavaScript and HTML, so I didn't have to. And that is someone called Tim Holman, who is also the author of the uselessweb.com, which is like my favorite website ever. Um, so Tim's cursors use HTML canvas. And this is much more performant than rendering directly into the DOM. And you get much more fine grain control over positioning as well. You can add loads more elements. I mean, look how many stars there are. We had seven three pixel square divs in the other one that I couldn't even show you the demo of because it literally doesn't work anymore. Um, but this would be massively complex to render as separate DOM elements. And it uses a request animation frame as well, which allows us to batch these um, animations up into repaints so for, um, for efficiency as well. And what's really cool is that Prefers Reduced Motion also works in JavaScript. So we can check the value of Prefers Reduced Motion using window.matchmedia, and if, um, if, if they don't have that set to prefers reduced motion, we can initialize the cursor. And you can also add event listeners to this as well. So we can initialize or destroy the cursor if the reduced motion setting changes, which I think is really cool. You can actually watch it happening in front of your eyes when you change the, the setting. All right. <coughs> Who had a web ring? Who was in a web ring? Okay, disappointing. <laughs> I definitely thought that was going to be more hands. Never mind. Web rings were how we used to find similar websites before search engines were any good, or just lists of people's websites. Um, and these gave you a real sense of community. So every site would have a plaque a bit like this. Um, there would be a back end somewhere, probably written in Perl, that would point to the previous and next sites in the ring, or you could go to a random one, or um, list all of the sites. Um, so naturally, I built a web ring for everyone at this conference. Um, and if you have a website, I would love you to join. Uh, you can join by uh, scanning this code. And at the end, after the talk, I'm going to rebuild my site <laughs> so, it will, so it will show up and I'll tweet out the link as well. Thank you. Um, so this is uh, based on a Google form. Uh, I think in real life, um, I'd probably use something like I've seen it done with JSON files in GitHub so you can PR um, your site. Um, and, but I wanted to avoid a lot of PRs and merge conflicts for this demo. Um, but it, yeah, so it's a spreadsheet with a Google form on top. And um, I'm using serverless because in 2022, servers are for losers. Um, <laughs> and I'm using <laughs> Cloudflare workers. Um, so the important thing here is we've got this request handler and um, we, we need to know the referrer of the request. So this is the site the request is coming from. And so if you were to click on click through uh, the next button on the web ring plaque on my website, the referrer would be my URL. And we can use this and the data from the spreadsheet um, and we can figure out where's my site, where is this address in this array of websites, which is the next one, which is the previous one, et cetera. Amazing. Before social media, a guest book was a way of saying you'd visited and leaving a compliment or an insult if you were that kind of person. 
Um, this is the guest book from Litter Explains It All, which is the website I used to learn <coughs> HTML in 2000, 2001, and it's still there. Um, I don't think the implementation of guest books has massively changed, um, so I thought I'd do something a little different for this one. Um, so first of all, I'd love you to sign my guest book right now. Um, you can do it, it's on Twitter. It's a Twitter thread, so I'd love you to uh, reply to this thread, please. And while you're doing that, I'm going to show you a bit about how it works. So this is my guest book. I got some of my colleagues to do it. Um, it's powered by something called Web Mentions. And this is a protocol to notify a website when someone else links to them. And this might be on their website, on Twitter, or et cetera. And these Web Mentions are collected as a feed, and they're associated with a web address. And I've got a meta tag in the head of this website that, that lets web mention services know that I'm looking for mentions, and then I can just publish them however I want. And I'm using webmention.io for, um, for this talk, and it receives those pings for me, and on my own site, I've, at build time, I'll then fetch the web mentions and render them. I've gone client side for this talk only because it means I can update it in front of your eyes, right? Um, and I'm getting web mentions from Twitter with Bridgie. And this polls from the Twitter API. And when people mention pages on my site, uh, Bridgie will pick it up and it feeds into webmention.io. So, let me just grab a poll. Poll now. Look, let's see who's been signing. So this does rely on, um, the problem is that this demo is that it relies on a third party service polling. So um, I can see some things coming in on Bridgie. Let's have a look. <gasps> what? Uh, nice try, whoever that was. Nice try. Thanks everyone. So. Um, I would just like you to leave you with one last thing. Um, reveal just, I just, I can't deal with this. I'm going back to keynote next time. <laughs> but I want you to go forth and build weird stuff. Just be experimental, be creative. I would love to see what you build. Um, the more pointless, the better, honestly. Like, it's about time we just started building stuff for the hell of it again. So thank you so much for listening and um, yeah. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day.